<laughs> Praise God. So we've seen that video. Um, that's one of the ways we support um, people out there. And you can always support the organization through your prayers and any support you have. That organization has been going for 10 years. And that is not uh, child's play. Uh, it's time to hear God's word today. And I believe that God's word has an answer for every life. God's word inspires hope. God's word gives us encouragement. So I believe that God has given me a, a practical message today that, that will affect different spheres of your life. So I'd like you to pay attention. But here, we usually take a confession before we hear a message. And the confession is going to come up on the screen. I'd like you to be focused, don't be distracted. It's good practice to take notes when you hear a message uh, because there's a connection between your hand moving and your brain. And then you can always go back to the notes afterwards. So please be receptive to hear God's word today. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, so we're going to take our confession together on the screen. It prepares us for God's word. Want to ready go? Today, today I'm humble enough, enough to open my heart, my eyes, my ears, to let God's word reach me. I participate and listen with humility. I obey and practice what I hear in faith because God is my friend. I'm receptive. I'm fully attentive to receive all that God has for me today in this world. Amen. God, I ask that you open our hearts, you will take away distractions in this place, and let this word have a meaning in our lives in the name of Jesus. Let it make a difference. Let it be you speaking to your people, and let there be receptive hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12 today. And really, you see, the, the, the text is written by Mark. And in this, in, this, in this particular passage of the scriptures, we're going to see uh, a beautiful story. It's a story of a paralyzed man. And we're going to get to see how the person was healed, was transformed. It's a beautiful story. When somebody is depressed, somebody is sad, somebody is paralyzed, and suddenly there's a change, that's a beautiful story. How many of you would like to see a change in your life? Yeah, yeah that, that's a beautiful, it's a beautiful story. So we're going to read Mark chapter 2, 1 to 12, and I'm going to read uh, from the New Living Translation of the Bible. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon, the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. You see, we live in a time where people would rather talk about you than carry you. People would rather talk about you than support you. And in fact, I think the concept of friendship is fading away. Because it's now all about what I can get from them, what I can get from that person. There's, there's a phrase called eat or be eating. That, that's what it's out there now. People will get something from you. So the concept of even true love is, is fading away. And that's why people can be in a relationship for 10 years and still keep secrets. Because people are no longer interested in a real and active relationship. But these four men are different and they are willing to carry their friend. Verse 4. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. I'd like you to pay attention to some of the words in verse 4. Uh, which uh, the author of this book uses to describe the sacrifice and the dedication of the friends, the four friends. He used the word dog, he used the word lowered to show that these guys were really dedicated and committed to helping this man. Praise God, somebody. Yeah. Verse 5, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my, my child, your sins are forgiven. My child, your sins are forgiven. You see, the Hebrews, they use the word son and child to mean the same thing. They used to denote affection, compassion. So Jesus was calling that guy his son, he was calling that guy his child. So the Hebrews used that word for children, they used it for grandchildren, they used it for their friends, just to denote affection. So Jesus was basically saying to the person, I've got you, I've got you, I'm going to, I care about you, and I'm going to heal you. I'll, I'll, I'll read verse 6 now. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? 
Is it easier to say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Verse 12. And the man jumped up, he grabbed his mat, and walked out through the storm on Lucas. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we have never seen anything like this before. Amen. 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 The title of this message is, Check Your Company. Check Your Company. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a popular saying out there uh, that, that basically goes like this. It's like, if you, if you want to go far, go alone. But if you want to go fast, go together. I personally think that it should sound like something like this. If you want to go slow, go alone. If you want to go fast, go together. Amen? Yeah. That's, that's why I feel, I feel it should sound like. If you want to go slow, go alone. If you want to go fast, go together. You know, when I was preparing this message, I remembered how we started the organization that you just saw uh, in the video. I was a university student. And what I basically did was that when I got the vision in 2008, I called some of my friends together, several of my friends, and I sat them down and I shared the vision of the organization with them. And since then, we've been working together. So we worked together in 2008, we had plans, we prayed together, we had dreams. And in 2009, 17th of January 2009, we launched the organization. And the organization has been thriving since. I, I, wouldn't, have been, I, I, would have, I wouldn't have been able to do it alone. But because I called people together, because I called a company together, the vision was shared, and 10 years later, the organization is still thriving. And I think Jesus understands this. Jesus called 12 guys together, 12 disciples, and they shared the vision of the kingdom with them. He shared the vision of, of what he came to do on earth with them. And several thousands of years later, we are all gathered here. I think he understands that. And in fact, when Jesus was sending out his disciples, he sends out the 70 because he understands the power of company. And then he sends people out two by two, two by two, because two are better than one. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy 32, verse 30, it says that one shall chase a thousand, but two shall put 10,000 to flight. Alone, you can go slow, but together, you go fast. Yeah. And I think one of, one of the ways you know who you are becoming is by looking at the people that you surrounded yourself with. Yeah, that's one of the ways you know who you are becoming. Because the reality is that every person is a, is a function, every behavior is a function of a person and their environment. Every act, every attitude is a function of a person and their environment. Paul was writing to the book to the Corinthian church and he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, he says, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. And I think the opposite is true. The opposite is true. Good company produces good character. And this is what we get in the Christian faith. You know, the Christian faith is not an individual thing. It's not a solitary work. It's, it's a family affair. It is a family affair. So we get saved into God's family. The church is God's family. It's a family affair. It is not just a selfie thing. It's not just a selfie thing. There's a picture I want you to have a look on the screen. Uh, can you bring, bring up a picture? Now look at this picture. There are some people in this picture that are seated here. Ayo, uh, the lady in front is one of the people in the, in the picture. Ayo, if you have to be honest, when you looked at that picture, who did you look at first? Or who did you look at the most in the picture? Be honest. Yourself. <laughs> you look at yourself. It's, it's a reality. If Isaiah, my son, that's my son Isaiah. If he was here, he will, he will look at himself first. That is because we live in a selfie generation. Can you say selfie generation? Selfie, selfie generation. Selfie generation. Yeah. In fact, several people are writing about the selfie generation. There are so many, if you look online, you type it on Google, selfie generation, you're going to see so many articles, so many things, publications written about this. And the, 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 the reality of so many things that out there is that people have said that there's a connection between the selfie generation and loneliness. Now people are becoming increasingly lonely in our world today. Researchers say that snapping regular selfies could be a sign of loneliness and mental health. 
I, I don't have any problem with selfies. I have a selfie here this morning. <laughs> I don't have any problem with selfies. But I think when it becomes increasingly all over the place, then you know that something is wrong, when it becomes excessive. The researchers say, said that it could indicate that there's a damage to the, to the snapper's psycho psychological well-being. And it, it could mean that they have troubles in relationships with other people. The selfie generation. That is why, that is why our world is suffering from loneliness. The, the research says that there are over 9 million people in the UK suffering from loneliness. Over 9 million people. And the thing with, with loneliness is that you can be amongst a crowd and still be lonely. The thing with loneliness is that you can be in front of the TV and still be lonely. Praise God, somebody. I believe that there are people here who have been depressed in the past, who have had strong loneliness in the past. And just because they change their character, they change their environment, they change their habits, they change their company, they started making great progress. Because they joined the body of believers, they started making progress. And in fact, most of us don't know that there is healing in even coming to church weekly. We don't know that. That there's healing in even, in even coming consistently to church. We don't know that there's, there's healing in that. There's healing in serving a church because when you're serving a couple that is bigger than yourself, it makes you whole and healthy. It's a blessing to have it. Let me tell the person beside you, check your company. Check your company. And check your company. But we are going to explore this subject today with a few points. The, the first point I want us to look at is strong friends. Strong friends. Because what happened in our text is that we see a paralyzed man. We see how this paralyzed man was helped. He was, he was supported. He was carried. He was pulled out. Just because he had the right company. He had four strong friends. I preached, on, I, I preached like, I think, two messages from this text before. But I feel like God is giving me a new approach or a new dimension to this message. This guy would have died paralyzed. There's a story in the Bible about a guy who was by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. Could it be that if, the, if that guy had four friends, maybe he wouldn't have been by that pool for that long? Could it be? Could it be? But these four friends, they saw past their friends' weaknesses. Usually when people, are, when people have a condition, it's easy for them to gather around the people that have the same condition. So if somebody is a paralyzed man, you will work with paralyzed people. But there's something so different about this guy that he was able to attract four strong friends. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful who you surround yourself with. But for you to actually get what is happening inside this text, you see, what those four friends did was un unprecedented. Because normally in those days, if somebody is sick, if somebody is sick, people will say, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they will say, it is because of that guy's sins. That's why he's in that condition. Say, for instance, if somebody is unable to conceive, they will look at the guy and say, the lady or whatever. They will say, you, you are unable to conceive because of your sins. But you, you begin to look at the reaction of those guys, and that is why they reacted when Jesus said that that guy's sin was forgiven. Let's say Mark 2, 6 to 8. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? What is, what is Jesus saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. God was right in front of them in Jesus, and they missed it because of religion. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your heart? I believe that for people who are already Christians, it's easy for us to just take the side of Jesus and say, oh, yeah, 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 that those guys are wrong. But for you to understand what was happening there, you need to understand that in, in that particular context, what Jesus was doing was posing a threat to what was happening. It was like the opposite of what was the norm in that day. Are we together? Yes. It was the opposite. It was the opposite. And, and that is what Jesus' life is, is all about. He came to confront the negative order in the society. And, and when you look at our society today, you'll see that the norm, the normal way of doing things is the opposite of what God is trying to, to do in our lives. Do you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. And even in our world today, you see that the order is domination, it's, it's, it's a lack of service, it's lack of generosity. It, it's, it's just like there's always a boundary, there's a gap. But what Jesus came to do is to change that. And that's why personally I don't get it when people say they are followers of Christ and they are, they are not serving, they are not making a difference, they, they are not generous. Because that's what Jesus came to defeat, that's what Jesus came to, came to correct. Amen. Amen! So these four friends in our text, they they understand the meaning of service. 
They understand the meaning of service. They went out of their way to serve this paralytic. They carried the man. They dug a, they dug a roof. They lowered it. And they did all that in faith. Because there was no guarantee that if they went through all that, that they would be able to get through all the, all the, all the obstructions, the crowd, and everything just to be able to even get the guy to Jesus. But that didn't stop them anyway. You need a faith-filled company. Let me tell the person beside you, you need a faith-filled company. I, I, like, I like to describe uh, the context of this, of this particular passage so that you can understand what these four friends went through. And for you to really understand, you need to understand how houses were built in that time. You know, most of us, we live uh, in houses or flats where just once you, come, once you come off the street, you open your door and you walk in, isn't it? But back in the day, for you to be able to get to the front of the door, you would walk through a long passage. And usually on each side of the, of the passage, there are benches, chairs that people would sit on each side of the from the entrance of this building, all the way, all the way, there will be, there'll be, there'll be a long passage and there will be chairs on each side, long benches, and people will be seated there. And right after, right further down, you will have a door, and then on the right hand side, you have, is, you have stairs leading to the roof of the building. And then inside the house, there will be, of course, crowd because Jesus was preaching in this particular place. And so those guys carried their friend from right wherever they were coming from, and they walked through the crowd. They walked through the obstruction. And after, after getting to the front of the entrance, they climbed the stairs. And they got to the roof, and they dug the roof. Imagine somebody just digging the roof and trying to lower somebody here. That's what happened. They went through all that in faith. And this is what happened. Look at that. This is, this is what happened. And then they lowered, they lowered the guy in front of Jesus just to be able to get him to heal it. Only real friends can do all that. Yeah, only real friends can do all that. Check your company. Check your company. Yeah, check your company. I think the thing with many of us is that we need to be carried when we are trying to carry ourselves. This paralytic man needed help. And he must have fully cooperated for him to be able to get help. Imagine somebody trying to carry you all the way amongst the crowd and you're punching the person in the face and saying, get up, get up, get up. But you need help. Amen. Amen. He needed help, but he must have fully cooperated with his friends. He cooperated in faith, even though the faith must have been a borrowed faith. The faith of his friends. That's what he did. But so for most of us, the reason why we are not attracting the right help is because we do a good job covering and hiding our weaknesses. We, we do a good job frustrating the people that are called to, to help us. The people sent to help us, we frustrate them. That's what we do. That's what we do. And I think sometimes people forget that friendship is a two-way thing. Sometimes people forget that pastoral relationship is a two-way thing. Imagine I'm trying all my best to reach out to somebody and the person is blocking everything. It's a two-way thing. It's a two-way thing. Yeah. And what will happen is that God will start changing your circumstance when you start to have a good attitude. God will start surrounding you with answers when you change your attitude. Unfortunately, many people go through life floating looking for the next place, the next thing that will change all their problems without committing to a group, without committing to a company, without seeing, staying firm in a place. And the thing is that you see, there, are, there are no perfect groups. There are no perfect people. There's no perfect groups. Now, somebody said that if you're looking for a perfect group, once you find it and you get into it, it becomes imperfect because you are not perfect. Somebody say amen. amen. And I think most of us as well would rather get ourselves in a company where we can prove all that we know. We can prove that we know it all. Yeah. But you see, if all you do in your circle is prove that you know it all, you won't attract help. You won't attract help. We all need God's strength. How many of you need strength today? We all need God's strength. We all need God's strength. We are all in need of help. And that paralyzed man was the weakest in his group. He was the weakest. And he knew it and he understood it. And his four friends also knew it. And they took responsibility to help him. So I was thinking about how did a broken man manage to attract help? How did a broken man manage to surround himself with strong people? Irrespective of their age, their status, how did he manage to surround himself with strong people? It was his attitude. Check your company. Check your company. Let, let's, talk about, let's talk about the second point, spiritual healing. Spiritual healing. You see, the greatest healing anybody can have is spiritual healing, internal healing. 
And that's why Jesus addressed that first. David said, he said, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. That is internal healing. Because what happens is that if you get a change on the physical side and you are not changed on the inside, you will stay the same. Yes. You will remain the same, you will remain stuck. Mm. And then you just continue in that cycle even after you've received the physical healing. Yeah. You see, just because we are in church doesn't mean that that's the end. There's, there's something that needs to take place on our inside. There's a healing that needs to take place on the inside. And that is what, that's what the right company will do for us. Spiritual healing is available in the right company. Yeah. That, is, that is the most important type of healing. And that's why Jesus addressed it first in our text. And I think Jesus is not trying to say that the paralyzed man is especially sinful. Or that the condition of the paralyzed man was caused by a sinful, a sinful trait. He was just basically addressing the greatest need of man. The, the common root of all pain and suffering. It is sin. Man's sinful condition. Somebody uh, called Wyersby said that forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. And it brings the greatest blessing and the more lasting results. That's the greatest healing anybody can have. Spiritual healing. Physical, physical healing is good, and Jesus also specializes in that, but the greatest miracle anybody can have is healing on the inside. Because if you are healed on the outside and you're not healed on the inside, you will stay the same. And these four friends have the faith to push their friends to a place where the person could have spiritual healing. Yeah. That's what they did. Mark 2 verse 5. Let's see Mark 2 verse 5. It says, seeing their faith. Can you say their faith? Yeah. Yeah. Seeing their faith. That's the faith of the four friends. Seeing their faith. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. That's, 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 that's the connection between the sacrifice of the friends and what was really needed. Their faith. The sins are forgiven. And you may be there today thinking that your greatest need is physical. But could it be that your greatest need is Internal is on the inside. And what happens is that you see, most times complete healing takes time. But real change starts within. Because you can walk and still be sick on the inside. You can clap your hands and still be sick on the inside. You can come to church and still be sick on the inside. You can raise up your hand to signify that you want to follow Jesus and start a relationship and still be sick on the inside. Complete healing takes time. But that is that is where God starts from. Yeah, that is where God starts from. So you need a good company to experience complete spiritual healing. You need a good company to experience maturity and perfection. And that is what God happens. That, that's what God does. But you see, spiritual healing is the starting place, but God also specializes in physical healing. Can you say physical healing? Physical healing. Yeah. That, that's one thing about God. God also specializes in physical healing. And physical healing can mean many things for many people. It could mean freedom from depression. It could mean uh, a, a good, a healthy marriage, it could, it could mean healing of worries and anxieties, it could mean healing of strongholds. And that's, there's also a connection with the right company and physical healing, because the right company will position you for physical healing as well. Yeah. And Jesus proves that he's able to perform physical healing. healing. And I, I personally believe that today it still happens. How many of you believe that miracles still happen? Physical healing still happens? Yes, I believe that. Physical healing can happen through a doctor, or it can also happen directly through the power of God. Let, let's, let's see Mark 2, 11 to 12. Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. That's from Jesus. Jesus also performs physical healing. And the man jumped up, he grabbed his mat, and walked out through the storm on Lucas. That's a miracle. They were, they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we have never seen anything like this before. That's a miracle, isn't it? Put your hands together for Jesus. That's a miracle. And all that happened because of the four friends. Because of the four friends. And I think that's the power of the local church. That's the power of company. That's the power of community. Nothing is as beautiful as the church. Nothing is as beautiful as the right company. That's the power of life. And that's why we should treat it very well. That's why we should be consistent in it. That's why we should pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the church. Because there's nothing as beautiful as the local church. Check your company. Check your company. Those four guys, they, they got the message. Because they worked together. They, they knew that they were greater together. They, they worked together to get their friends to a place where they could be 
physical healing. You need, you need strong people around you. Strong people who can bear some burdens and break some norms. Yeah. I think for some of us, you see, this message would mean having a big adjustment in our lifestyle. Because we are some of us are not used to this. For some of us, this message would mean having a mutual adjustment. But the little adjustment, adjustment, but the strong adjustment can lead to massive dividends. Massive dividends. Let me, let me give you this news. You see, you don't necessarily need a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You need a faith friend. Let me tell you the person beside you, you need a faith friend. You need a faith friend. Okay. You, don't, you don't necessarily need a BF or a GF. You need an FF. <laughs> <laughs> is that not who Jesus is? Yes. Is that not what the body of Christ is? Yes. Yeah. If you've been walking life alone, there's a the potential for you to be weak, sad, dull in context. But when you walk with the right company, you have the potential to be strong, yes. to be bold, to be courageous. Mm -hmm. Because destiny is built in the right company. Yes. Destiny is built, is refined, is made solid in the right company. But it is damaged and destroyed in the wrong company. Check your company. Yeah. Check your company. So this story that we looked at started with just four friends who are willing to make a difference. But he ended with life change. Yes. He ended in front of Jesus. Because real friends, we always push you to Jesus. Real friends, we always draw you closer to Jesus. Because that, that's, where, that's where real change happens. Yeah. As a pastor, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you closer to Jesus. Let's come together. Let's serve. Let's, let's make a difference in lives. I'm trying to, to get you closer to Jesus. And that is why we have this church here. That is why we are here. Church is a good company. People go through life in pain, with challenges. But if we can just get them to Jesus, we can make a difference in their lives. Church is a good company. Life group is a good company. And actually, you see, we are launching a new semester of life groups from this week. The whole term semester of life groups starts this week. This, this is a great opportunity for us to build a strong network where we can do life together. I'm, I'm personally hoping that I will be able to visit uh, some of these life groups or most of these life groups during this semester. It is, it is your company that will make it possible for you to stand when it's difficult. It is your company that will make you to keep going in the face of obstructions. When you feel like quitting, it is your company that will push you to keep going. They will talk you to order. They will tell you to keep running your race. Yeah. They will talk you to peace. Check your company. Yeah, check your company. We've done something uh, with this semester, uh, with this life groups, so that we can build momentum and be consistent. We've broken it into groups. So in a year, there are three semesters. This current semester runs from October to December, and we can take breaks in between. And uh, this is something that is at the heart of transformation. This is something that is at the heart of what Jesus came for. And when we begin to live like this, we begin to find an expression of who we are called to be. We're going to find an expression of who God has called us to be. We begin to even draw people around us in because that's what real life change will do. And when we begin to live this way, four things will happen. Can you say four things? Four things. Four things will happen. Brother, can you bring it up on the screen? Four things will happen when we begin to live this way. The first thing that will happen is that God will get the glory. God will get the glory. Is that what, is that what we want? Yeah. God will get the glory. And that's what happened with that, with that man. Jesus got all the glory. And the thing is that we also get blessed and we grow. We don't stay the same. We don't stay static. We get blessed and we grow. The world also takes notice. The world takes notice. Those guys said, we have never seen anything like this. And it's not like Jesus had not performed any miracles before then. But that, that, was, that was different. The world takes notice. And the unthinkable happens. The unthinkable happens. The unthinkable happens. And that's what happens when we partner and surround ourselves with the right company. Yeah. You don't necessarily need a BF or GF. You need an FF. Mm -hmm. Check your company. You need a faith friend. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Have you been blessed by that? Yes. Let, let's go on our feet as we pray together. Let, let's rise up. We're going to pray and respond to this message. Check your company. Let me tell the person beside you, check your company. Check your, yeah, check your company. I'd like you to just bow down your heads and just pray. You know, this is God's word. God has spoken to you now. It's an opportunity for you to speak to God. Prayer is basically conversation with God. So I'd like you to just 
meditate on the words you've heard, meditate on this message. What are some of the things in your life right now that are stopped, that, that, the things that are stopping you from experiencing life change? What are some of the things that hinder you from becoming consistent in the right company? What are some of the things that are like obstructions for in your life right now? Things that are stopping you from making a commitment? What are some of the things in your life right now that are stopping you from experiencing spiritual healing? Think, think about it. What are some of the things in your life right now that are stopping you from experiencing spiritual healing? Think about it. Are you surrounded with the right company? I'd like us all to meditate on this message. Are you surrounded with the right company? What is your attitude to the company around, around you? Are the people around you leading you to Jesus? Do you value community? Do you value community or you frustrate the people's sense to make a difference in your life? Yeah. Think about it. Think about it. Where are you right now in your walk with God? Where are you right now in life? Think about your journey and some of the things that you're currently doing. What are some of the things you're currently doing that are not pleasing to God? And how can you make decisions that will lead you to be stronger and better in the right company, with the right company? The good thing about this story that we've looked at is that, you see, it did not, it did not end in pain, it ended in joy, it ended in glory, it ended in testimony. And that's because four friends decided to, to gather together and partner with God. Can we be a company today? Can we be a good company today? If you don't mind, if, if, if you're comfortable, can you hold your hand of the person beside you? If you're comfortable with that. It's not, don't be under pressure to do that. If you're comfortable, can, can we be a good company today? Can we be a good company today? Can we create a strong company for healing, an atmosphere where healing can occur? Yeah. I'd like you to pray for the person beside you. Can we be a good company today where we can be, we can pray for each other? Maybe the person you are holding right now has a particular thing in their heart. Sometimes people don't want to People don't want to say anything out, and that's why we need a good company because it will be awkward if you just come out here and just start telling everybody your, your troubles. You may not feel comfortable, but you can have a company where you can where you can share your heart with, where you can expose your hearts, and your, your company can lead you to Jesus. They can lead you to where there is answer. I like you to pray for the person you're holding. Pray for physical healing, or pray for spiritual healing as well. Pray for a touch from God. Yeah, that's what the four friends did. They stood by their friends. And can we pray together? Pray for freedom in Christ. Let's pray for passion. Let's pray against sickness. Let's pray against disease. Let's pray against coldness. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray for miracles. Does anyone we sit here? Anyone in the church, in the true best church, we pray for healing for them. In the name of Jesus, we pray for physical healing. But we also pray for spiritual healing. We pray for the healing of our hearts. If there's anyone here who is depressed, who is sad, who is down, you thank you because you're bringing life. You're bringing life to them. You're bringing hope to them. You're bringing comfort to them. You're bringing resuscitation to them. Father, we thank you because your presence is here right now. We are praying to God that we, we believe that He answers our prayers. We believe that He answers prayers. Thank you, Jesus, because this, this church will be a praying church. This church will be a church that converses and speaks to God, that believes in people, that believes in miracles. Father, we thank you because we are knowing you more in intimacy. We thank you because your breath being revived in our hearts. We thank you because you're giving us hope today, joy forever. Hope today, joy forever. Some of you need to respond to this message right now. Respond to it. Respond to it. Respond to it. Respond in your words. Respond with, it, with, with, with your hearts. I ask for a touch upon us as a church. I ask for a touch upon our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is, a, there is an opportunity to respond to this message right now. And I, I want us to respond in many ways. Some of us might not be comfortable to come forward for prayer. Uh, but at the end of the service, there's usually an opportunity for prayer. We need to 
feel like you need prayer for anything, you can walk up to me, you can walk up to Debbie. We have many spaces here where we can pray together without being, uh, without being dodgy or, 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 or just being somehow. We can pray together, we can agree together, whatever your needs are. But I want you to know that this is a good company. And you say, this is a good company. This is a good company. And the, the, this church is a church that is here, positioned in this place by God. And we're going to be reaching out to so many people this month. We're going to be having so many outreaches. But I want us to all stand together as a good company, as a company where people can walk to and experience joy and experience hope and, and put a smile on people's faces because we have Jesus to offer. Praise God, somebody. Hallelujah. If you're here today, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to make a commitment, maybe you, you feel like you're stuck somewhere, but you want to make a commitment to give your life to Jesus. If you don't mind, can we all close our eyes? If, if, if you're here today, you, you feel like you, you are stuck, maybe you're stuck with sin, maybe you feel like you struggle with the same sin over and over again. Sometimes I think people try to use their efforts to stop, to stop struggles. But you don't need your efforts, you just need Jesus. That's all you need. And the more you know Jesus, the more all those things will drop off. You don't need to beat yourself up. The more you know Jesus, the more all those things will drop off. So if you're here today, you want to make a commitment to Jesus, you want to give your life to Jesus, or you want to just commit one specific thing to Jesus, do you mind if you lift up your hands and we're going to pray together? We're going to pray together. Thank you for all the people responding. Don't be afraid, just do it. If you're doing anything, you're afraid. Thank you very much. Can we all pray together as we end this message? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I give my life to you today. I give my, life to I give my heart to you today. I give my, heart to I give my struggles to you today. To Come into my heart and make a difference. Change my life. I want to know you more. I want you to make a difference in my life. I believe you can make a difference. I give my life to you today. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus and worship him.